Early on July the 16th, 1969, vast numbers were gathering along the beaches of central Florida to witness history. The American people had been preparing for this moment for almost a decade since the late President Kennedy had responded to the Soviet Union's early superiority in space technology by setting a trip to the moon as a national goal. More than a million people were crowding the roads and causeways around Cape Canaveral that had recently been renamed Cape Kennedy. Minor dignitaries and friends and families of space workers had access to special stands constructed in the grounds of the Kennedy Space Center to see the Apollo 11 astronauts blast off. While the public had great faith in NASA's ability to land men on the moon, the experts working in the space business put their chances of success at no better than 50-50. The astronauts had spent long hours in simulators preparing for every eventuality, yet the equipment they used for practice only provided an approximation of conditions in space, with some of the test rigs appearing bizarre. A special gantry built at NASA Langley provided something approaching the experience of lunar gravity. Hours before the scheduled launch, the giant Saturn V was slowly taking fuel. Its tanks would be constantly topped up till seconds before liftoff. Michael Collins was the command module pilot. He'd flown previously on Gemini 10. Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot. He'd pioneered new techniques for spacewalking on Gemini 12. That the leak has been corrected. And the mission commander was Neil Armstrong. On Gemini 8, his cool head and quick thinking had saved the mission from tragedy. Apollo 11 would have a fully experienced team chosen to deal with and solve difficult problems. And there would be problems. Every NASA mission had built on the experience of previous missions but there was always a point when they entered unknown territory and the pressure to reach the moon before the end of 1969 had been unrelenting. We're going to the moon together. But American people were supremely confident and launch parties were held across the country. Local entrepreneurs were quick to capitalise on the mood of celebration. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. At the Kennedy Launch Centre, tension was high. The German-born rocket pioneer, Werner von Braun, his whole life had been leading up to this moment. Below, we have a technician, a team of technicians working. Everyone at the Cape understood how many different components had to work correctly for a successful launch. Astronauts agreed that the launch made them most anxious. Firing command coming in now. This would be the sixth launch of the Saturn V booster. And while some of these flights had been a little lumpy, all were regarded as successful. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal, 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts, 6.
just seconds into the flight, control was transferred from the firing room in the launch complex to mission control in Houston. Twelve minutes after launch, Apollo 11 was in low Earth orbit. Apart from a slightly rough ride with the third stage, everything had been routine. Translunar injection and docking with the lunar module were now practices that had been done many times before, and they too were achieved with little fuss. The cruise to the moon and lunar orbit had been done twice before, and flight manuals and checklists had all been rewritten with the benefit of previous experience. The Apollo system had been designed so that all the navigation information and engine burns could be made autonomously by the crew, but radio ranging techniques had improved so rapidly that mission control was now giving all instructions. However, the crew still used the onboard technology to determine their position in case of a communications problem. Command module pilots took pride in the accuracy of their navigation. Both the command and lunar modules were equipped with the Apollo guidance computer, one of the first practical microcomputers. For most computations, there was a manual workaround, but for the complex flight path required for the lunar module to land on the moon, the flight computer was essential. Now in lunar orbit, the crew of Apollo 11 would lose radio contact every time they passed behind the moon. During the 13th orbit, the lunar module Roger, separated Roger. from the command module. Roger, how does it look? The, right. the two craft now adopted individual call signs. The command module became Columbia, and the lunar module was now Eagle. Descent to the moon happened in three separate stages, each controlled by its own computer program. The first stage was the braking phase that changed the orbit so it would reach a zone above the designated landing point. During this period, the crew were travelling feet first, looking up at the Earth. The next stage was the approach phase, when the Eagle tipped up into a more vertical attitude. This was when Aldrin and Armstrong got their first view of the landing point. A long elliptical region in the Sea of Tranquility was their target. The open plain was judged to be the easiest place for the first lunar landing. Now, unexpected things began happening. Fuel in the lunar lander's tanks began sloshing around. While this was not dangerous, the motion meant the craft could give no clear indication about its pre-programmed landing site. Program alarm. The 12.02. 12.02. Give us a reading on the 12.02 program alarm. Then the flight computer began sounding an alarm, and there was only one person in mission control that knew what a 12.02 alarm was. A young software engineer understood the computer was overloaded, but that it could still look after critical functions. The mission would continue. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. The final part of the landing sequence was still computer controlled, but it allowed the commander to override the craft's rate of descent and its positioning. As it was heading for a field of large boulders, Armstrong took control, looking for an appropriate landing area. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. This took a lot longer than anyone expected. 75. 875 feet, that's looking good, down a half. 
Six forward. Fuel was running low. 60 seconds. Lights on. Six. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. At 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Head. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Out control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. The relief in mission control was palpable. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Because of the distractions during the descent, no one had a clear idea of the Eagle's exact location. After the craft was made secure, the flight plan called for the astronauts to get some sleep, but Armstrong and Aldrin requested a change, which was agreed to. They began preparing for their walk on the lunar surface. Around seven hours later, Armstrong was climbing down the ladder. A black and white TV camera was now activated, and around the world, 600 million people were watching. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This was something new. No one had thought that history would be televised with the world as witness. It had even been argued that television was a waste of time. Now NASA was rescheduling future missions so their astronauts would step onto the moon in prime time. Armstrong and Aldrin spent two and a half hours on the lunar surface, and much of that time was used in ceremonial duties such as planting the US flag and chatting to the president. The trip back to lunar orbit went smoothly. From here, the three astronauts were back on thoroughly understood ground. The three-day return cruise to Earth was a calm period before a storm of publicity obligations that the Apollo 11 astronauts had not prepared for. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins were fated in ticker tape parades across the United States and then across the world. The generous taxpayer funding that had kept the space program going was now in doubt, and NASA was keen to build on this wave of popularity. But in the corridors of power, questions were being asked about the vast sums required to put men on the moon. With the last landing of the shuttle fleet in 2011, the United States, a major contributor to the International Space Station, was reliant upon Russia to ferry astronauts to and from the orbiting laboratory. Three, two, one, zero. But to get cargo and supplies to the ISS, NASA signed contracts with private space technology company SpaceX. SpaceX's cargo capsule, known as Dragon, has regularly been delivering hardware and consumables to orbit since 2012. Dragon can also return from orbit. 
It's a stepping stone to the company's Dragon version 2 crew capsule that will be able to take astronauts to and from space. Due to make its first manned flight in two years, the Dragon takes advantage of new materials and technologies to cut the cost of spaceflight. Its return through the atmosphere will make use of an ablative heat shield, and the current generation of Dragons return via conventional parachute technology. But the new capsule will use propulsive deceleration technology to make a pinpoint landing, enabling it to be reused. The Falcon 9 launches two stages will also return to the ground for reuse. A grasshopper technology demonstrator made its first flight in 2012. SpaceX conducted a series of experimental launch and return flights at its test site in McGregor, Texas. The vehicle made eight successful flights to refine the autonomous return technique. the technology has been incorporated in the Falcon 9. After launching a cargo craft, the booster's first stage attempts to return to an ocean platform. SpaceX technicians are aware that further refinements are needed. In 2006, the European Space Agency began work on a unique star mapper that became known as Gaia. Designed to orbit the Sun at a point 1.5 million kilometres beyond Earth, it will rotate, scanning our local galaxy to accurately gather positional information about the neighbouring stars. Two different telescopes feed images to the probe's of very large, high-definition camera. Over its five-year operational period, Gaia will rescan the same areas 70 times. As it orbits the Sun, its positional change will enable it to observe parallax differences from which accurate star distances can be determined. In addition to position and distance information, Gaia will collect two different types of spectral data. One will help determine the stellar object's speed and the other will indicate the object's chemical makeup. Gaia was successfully launched at the end of 2013 and has been functioning correctly since. Its pointing and positioning are achieved by cold nitrogen thrusters that do not compromise the satellite's thermal integrity. Gaia's data link with Earth can handle 3 megabits per second and it will be fed back to ESA's most sensitive ground stations at Sobreros, Spain, and New Norcia in Western Australia. Toward the end of the 1960s, America finally had something to celebrate. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins had returned safely from the moon.
For America, the decade had started with an uncomfortable realisation. Cold War adversary, the Soviet Union, had a commanding lead in space technology. The United States had been seized by a wave of anti-communist paranoia. Nine years and $17 billion later, Apollo 11 had planted the US flag on the surface of the moon. July 1969, it is. It came in peace for all mankind. Around the planet, 600 million people had watched on TV. The world's population was watching history, and they knew it. Uh, Tranquility Base, this is Houston. Can we get both of you on the camera for a minute, please? At beaches and rivers in central Florida, one million Americans had turned out to see the launch of Apollo 11. November the 14th, 1969, was a wet day at the Kennedy Launch Center. Numbers that turned out to watch the launch of Apollo 12 had dropped by two thirds. After the huge viewing numbers attracted by Apollo 11, NASA upgraded all aspects of the television coverage for the remaining moon landings. Pete Conrad would command the mission with rookie Alan Bean and command module pilot Dick Gordon. Their destination, the Ocean of Storms, just near the landing site of Surveyor 3, the unmanned craft that had touched down two years earlier. Six, five, four, Three, two, one, zero. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. 11:22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The driving rain was not seen as a problem. Although high winds could delay a launch, the Saturn V was an all-weather vehicle, and the wet conditions were not a factor. Roger, clear the tower. I got a pitch and a roll program, and this thing is really going. Roger, Pete. Soon after liftoff, lightning struck Apollo 12 and ran down the ionized exhaust trail to the launch tower. All instrumentation in the command module went haywire and telemetry readouts on the ground were showing garbage. Apollo 12, Houston, try FCE to auxiliary, over. For a short while, nobody in the craft or on the ground knew what had gone wrong. FCE to auxiliary. Finally, the crew was asked to flip an obscure reset switch. Only Alan Bean knew where it was. It restored all instrumentation and the mission could continue. Apollo 12, Houston, go for stage. Got a good S2, gang. Roger, we copy, Pete. You're looking good. This had happened at a critical period of powered flight, and mission control had come very close to calling an abort. Your thrust is looking good, Pete. The single Earth orbit was spent checking all systems before Apollo 12 was given the all clear to go to the moon. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. After the huge television audiences for the Apollo 11 lunar mission, NASA had equipped Apollo 12 with a color camera so that audiences around the world could see higher quality pictures from the surface of the moon. The second landing on the moon benefited greatly from design changes derived from the Apollo 11 experience. Baffles inside the lunar module's fuel tanks prevented unwanted sloshing that had confused the flight computer. See that? 81, 32, 33. The landing went exactly as planned, with the astronauts recognizing all the landmarks in the vicinity of the Surveyor 3 probe. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. 
TV starting to... But as Pete Conrad climbed toward the lunar surface, in the United States, it was 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, and very few people were watching the live television pictures. Viewer ratings were important for NASA. They knew keeping the American taxpayer on side was an important part of convincing politicians that the space agency's generous funding should be maintained. As Alan Bean joined Conrad on the lunar surface, he grabbed the TV camera to relocate it and inadvertently pointed it at the sun. They were the last live Apollo 12 TV pictures from the moon. The pinpoint landing, the much longer stay on the moon and the larger volume of return samples all made Apollo 12 a technical success. But NASA had wanted to keep the American public engaged with the space program and the only pictures anyone saw were short film grabs. Americans were losing interest in space. After the return of Apollo 12, there were still eight more Saturn V launch vehicles in production, enough to stretch as far as Apollo 20. But in January 1970, Apollo 20 was cancelled, and soon the planned Apollo 18 and 19 missions were also scrapped. As NASA was preparing to reap the benefits of space engineering and lunar research, the program was being curtailed. Things would change slightly for Apollo 13. NASA rescheduled the mission's lunar activity to coincide with prime viewing time across the United States. This would cost TV networks money, and they were not happy. Commander Jim Lovell had flown around the moon as command module pilot on Apollo 8. This would be his fourth space flight. His colleagues were both first-time astronauts. The lunar module pilot was Fred Hayes, but the third member of the team had come from the backup crew just three days before launch. Command module pilot Jack Swigert replaced the original crew member, Ken Mattingly, who had been exposed to German measles. Mattingly watched the launch from Mission Control in Houston. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Its objective on the moon was the Fra Moro Highlands, named after the adjacent Fra Moro crater. During powered flight, a second stage engine cut out early. The remaining units burned for slightly longer to compensate, but this was no major problem. Okay, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm pointing over toward uh, Jack and it's... Uh, Translunar injection happened smoothly, and the crew soon pulled out their colour TV camera to entertain the people back on Earth. But apart from the people in mission control, no one was watching. The TV networks failed to broadcast the transmission sent from Apollo 13. We've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Soon after they had ceased their transmission, with the spacecraft three quarters of the way to the moon, an explosion took out the command module's main power supply. Can say again, please. Uh, Nobody understood what had happened, but it soon became obvious that Apollo 13 would not land on the moon. Stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Jack, uh... With the command module effectively dead, the lunar lander now became the astronaut's sole source of power. Its descent engine would be used for all course corrections. The spacecraft continued out and around the moon on a free return trajectory. Now that's an Atlantic landing site.
A landing in the South Atlantic would get them back quickest, but there were no recovery ships in that area. Before Apollo 13 disappeared behind the moon, ground staff began recalculating the burn that would return the craft to the Pacific Ocean. While there was enough food and oxygen to last till the return to Earth, water and power would be critical. Before long, temperatures in the craft had dropped to near freezing. With strictly rationed water, Fred Hayes got a urinary tract infection. The plan was to restore power to the command module using the re-entry batteries just before they hit the Earth's atmosphere. This had never been done before, so a team of experts, including Ken Mattingly, began experimenting with different procedures in a simulator. NASA's space program was back in the headlines, but not for the reasons they wanted. Simulations of the power-up sequence were complicated because condensation, caused by the low temperatures in the command module, threatened to short out the electrical system. But finally, a procedure was radioed to the crew. The rescue showed NASA at its best, creatively solving difficult problems as they arose and returning the three astronauts safely. Apollo 13 would become known as a successful failure. Alan Shepard was NASA's first man in space. Though his Mercury capsule, Freedom 7, had only flown for 15 minutes, he was destined to become an important part of America's space program. In 1964, he was diagnosed with Meniere's disease and suspended from all flight activities. He spent the Gemini program as chief of the astronaut office. After corrective surgery, he was restored to flight duty and eventually was made commander of Apollo 14. His command module pilot was Stuart Rusa. And the lunar module pilot was Ed Mitchell. Apollo 14's objective was Fra Moro, the same area in the lunar highlands that had been targeted by the aborted Apollo 13. It would be the last of the H-type missions that carried no vehicle. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff from Apollo 14, three minutes past the hour. Finally, after almost 10 years, Alan Shepard was back in space. Not long after Apollo 14 reached orbit, his space flight time had doubled. Like all previous Apollo missions, it would be more complex than the one that preceded it. And like all Apollo missions, there would be problems. Docking with the lunar module should have been routine, but on this occasion, the mechanism would not lock. After five attempts, there was still no success. Okay, Houston, uh, we did it twice. On the sixth attempt, Stu Russo made a more aggressive use of his thrusters and the two craft locked together. We got some, Houston. I believe we got a hard dock, Houston. Okay, we seem real steady. I'm gonna In lunar up. orbit, after the lunar module Antares had separated from the mothership Kitty Hawk, the landing computer began flashing an alarm. The abort switch had an intermittent short that would trigger an automatic abort sequence if it happened during the powered stage of Antares' descent to the surface. At Mission Control, though they couldn't fix the switch, they decided to reprogram the computer so it would ignore the spurious alert. They had two hours to work out the new code. It fell to MIT programmer Don Isles, who came up with a workaround. The new sequence was tested in a simulator, and then the 61 keystrokes required were read up to the astronauts. The landing proceeded with pinpoint accuracy. 30 feet per second, look at three. 20 feet. 
10. Three feet per second. Contact now. Two, stop. Three. Oh. Okay, we made a good landing. The lunar module had landed on a seven degree incline that made moving in the cabin difficult. They were about one kilometre from the rim of Cone Crater, where they were scheduled to collect samples during this second moonwalk. As with every successful Apollo moon landing mission, the astronauts unfurled the American flag. Before Apollo 11, it had been proposed that the United Nations flag be planted. But Congress had passed a law stating that no flag other than the stars and stripes could be deployed. During previous lunar missions, astronauts had spoken about how difficult it was to judge distances and to recognise landmarks. Shepard and Mitchell were tiring during their climb toward the rim of Cone Crater. Doctors at Mission Control monitoring their heart rates became concerned. They were ordered to return without realising they were only 20 metres from their objective. But NASA was about to eliminate this problem. Apollo astronauts were training with a new piece of hardware. All remaining missions would be able to travel 10 times further from the lunar module using the new lunar rover. Geology was the main feature of the remaining Apollo missions. Preliminary analysis was showing that the moon had once been molten with rocks containing no trace of water. Dave Scott would command Apollo 15. Jim Irwin was the lunar module pilot. This would be his first space flight. Al Warden was the command module pilot. Apollo 15 was also his first space flight. Refinements in the design of the Saturn V launch vehicle and improvements in the targeting and trajectory parameters meant that a heavier version of the lunar module could now reach the moon, carrying heavier loads. The new expanded missions were called J missions. Not only could they take more to the moon, they could bring a greater mass of lunar rock back to the Earth. Their target on the lunar surface was Hadley Rill, a peculiar winding groove, probably formed by ancient volcanic activity. The landing site was in the lunar northern hemisphere near the Apennine Mountains. Separation of the lunar module Falcon from the command module was delayed by a hatch problem, but this was soon solved. Landing techniques were now so refined that Scott was easily able to compensate for an early six kilometer aberration and set Falcon down for another pinpoint landing. The quality of television pictures from the moon had continued to improve as audiences across the United States dwindled. The big difference was the rover. Not only would it allow the astronauts to travel further and to carry more samples, but without exerting themselves, Scott and Irwin used less oxygen and could stay longer on the surface. Dave Scott had taken his geology training very seriously and on the crew's second traverse in the lunar rover, this training paid off. They discovered a white rock at the bottom of the Hadley Rill, which was thought to be part of the lunar bedrock. It became known as the Genesis Rock, and it was more than four billion years old. After almost three days on the moon, Scott and Irwin prepared the Falcon for return to lunar orbit. There had only been a few minor glitches during the earlier parts of the mission, and rendezvous, docking and the crews back to Earth continued to remain problem-free. 
During the final descent, the remaining highly corrosive fuel from the capsule's thrusters was dumped, but this time it caused the collapse of one of the craft's three parachutes. Further damage would have been catastrophic. As 1972 commenced, there were only two remaining Apollo missions. Though the lunar expeditions were increasing in duration and complexity, the American people had lost interest, and so had the political administration. Life-threatening difficulties occurred on every flight, but NASA had been so good at overcoming problems that the drama of lunar exploration was easily pushed off the front pages by war and political scandal. When the last ever mission to the moon blasted off at night during prime time, TV networks were annoyed that launch delays messed up their viewing schedule. Astronaut Gene Cernan would be the last man to walk on the moon and with the return of Apollo 17 to the Earth, lunar exploration stopped. There are no plans to return to the moon.